talk about their programs and the wonderful work they do last but Paul unfortunately has another work commitment he runs groups at the gatehouse and they got to start now so he's going to talk about the gatehouse now and as soon as I finish all of the warm-up things and then he can take off and do his job um, so having done that job at the gatehouse I know it's important that he has to do that um, First of all, you know, they always call this housekeeping. The washrooms are down the other, not this hall, but the next hall, and that way. Uh, left, thank you, I'm ch directionally challenged. So the washrooms are there. Over there, uh, thanks to Torkin and Mains, there's pop, there's water, there's juice, there's little snacks. Um, they were very generous in supplying that for us. And, um, I'm I hate this. I'm going to hear myself saying, um, 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 and I'm just going to <laughs> cut my throat. Um. <laughs> you will see at the back of the room, um, I did it again. You know, when, when I'm in the States, I don't do um, I do A. And they tease me about it there. Yeah. So the, at the back of the room, and when you first came in, there were a bunch of t-shirts being played over and over and over again. And these t-shirts are made from, they're at Men at Weekends of Recovery, and they, they make these t-shirts. And they're so expressive of how the journey the men have been on. So we're going to talk a little bit about Weekends of Recovery, too, because Rob and I are both involved with Male Survivor Weekends of Recovery. That's another support system here. So that's helping us put these events on. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul, who I just met, and he's charming already, I know that. <laughs> Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Okay. I think it's because we did the same job. That's yeah. right. Oh. Okay. I'll give it back to you after. Do you want me to just stand here by you? How long are you going to be? Yeah, I'm not going to be that long. Okay. What do you want? Yeah, it'd probably be easier, eh? Okay. Yeah, okay. Is that well, please, please, please. The tough, has to be up. Okay. Is that, was that work? Have you got me? Yeah. All right. Okay. I, <laughs> I'll try not to do this. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paul Dunn. And uh, thank you very much, Lynn, for the introduction and for putting on this wonderful conference. I think that's really great. What a great turnout. So give yourselves a hand, eh, for coming. I'm the adult program coordinator at a place called The Gatehouse, which is just up the road a little bit. Um, and what we deal with is adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Some of you may know that about the house. Uh, some may not. I can see we have a facilitator here from the house and uh, a student placement. Um, so let me talk about the house a little bit. We do two phases. We have phase one and a phase two of peer support groups. Um, our phase one uh, for women, which is gender specific, is on Tuesdays, and for men is on Wednesdays. Um, it lasts for 15 weeks, and we go over quite a few uh, great topics, ones that I love, boundaries, uh, anger, triggers, um, ga shame and guilt. Nobody in this room has ever felt that, right? And, uh, and then uh, when we graduate from phase one, we actually do a co-op group, uh, or co-ed group, co-op, co-ed group uh, in phase two with both men and women. And uh, we're very proud of that one because, you know, when Arthur, who started the gatehouse, said it could never be, they told him it could never be done. But uh, having gone through, uh, I'm a survivor myself, having gone through both the programs, um, after about the first week, you're just sitting there with survivors, and it's not really gender specific, so. Um, I can't tell you how much the gatehouse has done for me. Um, for me, I got to the point in my life, uh, it was 50 years from when my abuse started to when I walked up those steps, and it was probably the hardest journey I ever made. Um, if I knew it was going to be so much easier after that, I would have made it a lot sooner, but uh, I really commend all the people that put all the effort into the gatehouse, the ones who started it, set up the groups, um, and uh, I know it's done a big change in my life. I have some brochures here about the gatehouse, which I'm going to leave over here. I'm also going to leave some of my cards. If any of you are, are interested or would like to come, uh, we offer, again, uh, peer support groups. Uh, they're free. 
So it's a 15 week on phase one and 16 weeks on phase two. We also have one-on-one, um, -on -one, which we'll do, six sessions. If you're not ready for a group, we try to get you ready for one. We also have some great, we have art therapy, which is a really great one. Uh, we also have a partners group uh, where we have survivors and uh, non-survivors uh, spend a day seminar. And we just let the non-survivors kind of have a, a more of an insight into what could be expected. Um, that's about it. So thank you very much for your time and enjoy the conference. I'm sure it's going to be great. I've got a fuzzy thing on me now. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Thanks so much, Paul. All right, great. Okay. I'll just put these over here. Now go to work. Yep, now I'm off to work. Unfortunately, I have never had the zipper of these pants undone, so I didn't even know they, were, they worked. I, I just thought they were there for show. Um, okay. So by now you should have gotten handouts for all the, uh, all the things we have here, the Dare to Dream program. And, um, and there's affirmations, and if you haven't got them there, they're over there, handouts and affirmations. They're all wonderful things to help you understand what we need to know about male survivors. One is, uh, if you think someone's a survivor, what do you say? The other one is, if you think someone... Uh, somebody has been abused, what do you say? You know, there's things like that, valuable, valuable information. So please take the, take the pamphlets at the end of the night, and tonight you're going to get a lot of good information, but it's also going to be very triggering for some. And consequently, um, we have what we call a safe room. If you feel triggered or upset, uh, you feel like you need to talk to someone, um, I'm going to thumb. Um, the first go the first hallway here. There's the first classroom on your left is um, a safe room, and Bonnie over there at the back, or Rob will go into the safe room with you, or me if Rob's talking. So one of us will go into the safe room with you, and we will help you get grounded. We'll help you calm down. We'll help you. So don't sit there in agony. Tri being triggered and having flashbacks. Don't do that to yourself. This has to be a safe room. This has to be a safe place or healing cannot take place. So let, please know and please use the safe room if you need to. All right? Deal? Now I'm going to hand this over to my buddy Rob. Right? Okay. We went over this a hundred times this afternoon and I'm still confused. <laughs> So we, we're going to uh, introduce you to some of the resources and support services that there are for uh, survivors and their families in this area tonight. Um, but I think the, the highlight of the evening is going to be uh, hearing the stories in condensed form of a number of survivors. We have four, five very courageous volunteers uh, who are going to tell you their stories. Uh, what happened, how it affected them, and how they are recovering. Um, that's going to be just before the break. We're going to have a break about halfway through. And to kind of warm up to that, we want to show you some briefer video clips done by survivors. <coughs> These are clips from various longer videos that, that have been done uh, over the years. And we think it'll just give you a bit of an idea of the diverse array of men 
the tremendously wide range of, of, of men that this affects. It affects everybody. Uh, and um, it'll give you a bit of a flavor of how it has affected them. So bear with me while I do the technology here. I just experienced many symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Um, and I, I thought I it was just uniquely me. Boys are sexually abused in, um, in vast numbers and vastly more frequently than as a society we're recognizing. I was absolutely amazed that in fact it was so common among sexual abuse survivors of feeling alone or feeling it was only you. I know that childhood rape separated me from my spirit. I thought I was broken most of my life. I struggled, fought, cried, prayed, and meditated my way back to me. While he was raping me, I felt like I left my body because I thought I was gonna die. So I wasn't present there, and actually I had agreed to die at that point. My grandmother just died last year. But she, she took me from my mom for about three months. <clears throat> and I don't think I would have lived without my, if my grandmother hadn't done that. Like she nurtured me and sheltered me and brought me back to myself. Because of my upbringing and just the pride that was instilled with me, I was able to continue to do so many successful things. I graduated from UC Berkeley. I'm a teacher, I've taught for 14 years. I've motivated many young people to be their greatest selves. And even throughout my pain, I was still able to help other people work through their own shame and guilt and even denial about childhood sexual abuse. He must have had my head on a pillow because the, um, I was suffocating. And it's not something that should be a secret. I was 13 when the abuse first started. And uh, he abused me several times a week for several years, all over this country, and even on a trip to Europe. He began to take the same interest and do the same things with my younger brother, and that concerned me. And it definitely galvanized my absolute determination to send a message to speak a truth, to help another survivor, without a doubt. I've always thought that asking for help would make me appear to be weak or not man enough, but actually asking for help is the most um, profound act of kindness that I can do for myself. There are so few men who've been abused who are getting help. It's tragic. It, it's, it means there's so much more suffering than there needs to be. I would call around to rape crisis centers and places that said they specialized in childhood sexual abuse, but no one had any place for men. And when, they would, when I would ask the questions about men, everyone always thought I was a perpetrator. A major part of my healing process has been in like fellowshipping with other men. Um, and trusting, you know, and being able to be vulnerable and to be close and not feel like um, I was under threat or that anyone would take anything from me. This group has been beyond words amazing for me and my healing. My coping mechanism for a long time was alcohol and drugs, which I think is common with, you know, men or anyone um, dealing with traumatic situations. Until I owned what had happened and had been suffering up to that point. And then the pain of uh, owning it was kind of when the healing started. You know, I've had a lot of people ask me if, you know, if I'm, if I'm gay because of the rape. Rape is about power and control and it's not about sexuality. At that time, when I reported him, under New Jersey law, they were required to report him to the police. They did not. Had they, the criminal statute of limitations would have still been in, a, in effect and he would have been held accountable. But because they did not, he is a free man today. 
Good morning, Good Senator. We want to talk about the initiative to move the statute of limitations, you know, eliminating the statute of limitations for uh, crimes committed against uh, children. We certainly sent a very strong message to the institutions who are harboring and sex offenders that, that they can no longer get away with it. And Mars Advocacy and others, I think will have a real impact in terms of protecting children in those institutions. Well, I think he has to be more passionate than me. <laughs> From my freshman year in high school, I was always in the office for fighting and throwing chairs and just being really, really angry. Um, one of the vice principals told me that they were thinking about expelling me from the school. And he said that it wouldn't even be any use because I would either wind up killing someone or someone was going to kill me if I didn't control my emotional state. Well, I'm a forensic psychologist. And I've been researching child abuse, and in particular, the impact of sexual abuse on men. I started getting inquiries from attorneys who were representing men uh, who'd been charged with uh, serious crime, basically all homicide. I met uh, JT, uh, I believe it was 1994. He had been sentenced to death already. I'm not sure that I've met anybody who had a worse history of sexual abuse. Um, and JT was abused in other ways as well, psychologically, you know, physically abused. Um, but the sexual abuse was um, just horrific. What happened when you came in here after the crime? Wow. Uh, through some kind of crazy tragic means, I had done to somebody else what I wanted to do to myself. This is my total failure as a human being to have uh, taken a life. That's hard. I don't need no more than that, believe me. That's, that's crushing. I think there's a lot that you could say to young men who have been sexually abused, who are running from it. Plain and simple, I thought I was the cause. The reason why these people were sexually yeah. abusing you. Yeah, I thought I was the cause. One of the main reasons that I do this work is that I was abused when I was a kid. Thank you for sharing that. Well, we give each other strength, and that's what we do. You remember, that's what I got from you. I'm passing it forward. Things normal men experience, whether it be intimacy with their own spouse or partner, what, whatever it is, it's very different for that survivor. A simple touch could trigger uh, memories or flashbacks, and it makes it very difficult to have a normal, safe relationship. I think it's important for people who want to have an intimate relationship with someone who's had particularly a childhood trauma, uh, psychological trauma, to understand that what's involved is, is to enter into that journey with the person. It's, it's not simply to stand near them and be sympathetic and listen well. Um, it's, it's really a journey that you're, you will undertake together. There was nothing more liberating. I can't recall a bigger step in my own healing than when I broke my silence and told my story. And when you learn to, uh, to hope and trust and understand it's okay to be able to express yourself, even if it's something simple like playing with your kids. I know now that I, if a child would talk to me about it, I know what to do and I know the tools that I have in place. But I think if a child talks to an adult about it, it's their responsibility to get help. I've taken my life back, and I recognize it for what it is, and it was not something I did. So I have, I don't have that shame. I've shed that shame. The blame belongs there, not here. I think we have to reach out to teenagers um, and, and to, to young men in their, in their early 20s and in their mid-20s 
Um, and we have to reach out to them in a very, very proactive way. Men need to have hope. And when you have hope, you will heal, without a doubt. disturbing it uh, hits powerfully to see men talking so candidly and vulnerably about what's happened to them what's been done to them it doesn't just happen it's something that's done to them you heard a little bit about how abusers operate the quite creative and patient and persistent grooming efforts that they go through. Um, and you also heard uh, what has helped these men. A caring family member who was safe enough to talk to, who got it, who believed the victim, and another thing that you saw is how much value some survivors have found in reaching out to others and doing something to, to help other men who've been victimized by sexual abuse. And Lynn and I are going to do a bit of teaching, just the very basics about sexual abuse. How often does it happen? How does it affect men? What does the recovery process involve? And then we're going to see uh, a couple more video clips, uh, three actually, by two different male survivors who, are both of them here today? No, w One of them is here today and he's going to introduce his own video videos. Um, so um, I'm going to let you wear the microphone for this. How are we going to do this? Because know. you know what Maybe we should... We have the hand one. Of Will sound record through both microphones? Yeah, both microphones? Are you two filming separately? You are, aren't you? You need this. You're gonna, you're okay, gonna click, you use this one. Yes, thing. you're right. Um, okay, is that good? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? We, we, both Rob and I are very involved with an organization called MaleSurvivor.org. Um, you'll hear a lot about that later, but I prepared this PowerPoint with Rob Rob and I prepared this PowerPoint to kind of talk about some of the stuff that we have learned about from Male Survivor and that we, when we're doing training, we talk about. So it's just a, a very short PowerPoint and we'll talk a little bit about some of the issues. Lynn, before we start, did we say anything about the videoing that's going on? If oh. we didn't, oh, I did to the people pe deserve to know. I, and I think the whole audience deserves to know right. what what is going on with the video, with the, the filming here. Um, I think two different groups are, are filming here. Um, we have Justin's organization. Yeah, is filming and he, he's, why are we filming this? Um, well, as a part of sort of public education, public awareness, consciousness raising about this issue of male survivors, we like to get as much I'll be very brief. Um, so one of the things that's important to us is to raise public awareness about this as an issue. A lot of people are shocked to find out that men can be victimized in the ways that, um, that the video shows and that we're going to be hearing about today, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's trauma and other forms. So when we put on important events like this, we like to take advantage of that opportunity to get the word out. So what my colleague here, Sean, has been instructed is to only record those who are comfortable. And right now, that is just Lynn and Rob. Um, and uh, 
later on today after the panel is done, if any of you on the panel or anybody else in the audience wants to share your story in an interview format, I'm happy to uh, speak to you just one-on-one. -on -one. There are, in my experience, a lot of men who are you know, very comfortable and, and quite willing to share their story because they know that it can help others to, to speak out. But if you are not in that frame of mind, then absolutely that is totally understandable. So right now we're not planning, neither group's planning on recording the panel. Uh, I just want to be clear about that. Just Lynn and Rob, um, and maybe me when I speak again later. Um, but we do w want, and Ellen, yes, as well. Uh, we do want to do one-on-one -on -one interviews with anybody who's willing to speak, because it is a way to kind of raise that public awareness, which we think is uh, very important. So you can come talk to me afterwards. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting right there. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Lynn. And if I, if and I, the other group, go ahead. Let me finish. <laughs> and the other group is um, um, the group from Ryerson. They're doing this. It's a class project. So, so I'm going to paraphrase what you said because maybe other people won't hear it. Okay, they're doing a, their class is doing a documentary, and it's for the same reasons that Justin said to raise awareness about the issue of male sexual abuse and violence against men. Okay, so yeah, I forgot to tell you all of this stuff. Um, so feel f understand that you will not be on camera unless you actually say you want to be on camera. Okay. And now I'll just add that uh, the people filming have given us our, their assurance that they are going to be very respectful of that to the point where they will not film the question and answer period uh, after the panel presentation as well because that will include answers, statements, comments by the survivors on the panel and may include questions or comments from people in the audience who identify as survivors too or families. or families. So we want to be super respectful of that. Lynn and I present healing weekends for men with male survivor and confidentiality and safety That's are key. of paramount importance and we want to observe that here too. So we just wanted you to know that. Okay. Thank you. So um, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, click, click, click. Who can be abused or assaulted? Is that the first slide? Yeah. You let me know whenever you want the next one. OK. Um, so who do, who do you think can be abused or assaulted? Anyone. Anyone. Anyone? I have I'm a lot of agreement. Anyone? Yeah. Okay. So you're a smart group. <laughs> Anyone can be abused or assaulted. Any boy or any man at any age, any woman or any girl at any age. The age of first abuse usually is around the average age, 10.1. However, I have heard of people being abused in their crib, sexually abused in their crib. I'm one. Rob's one. Use of force, intimidation, or threats. It's like 36%. That's 36%. That means that the other 64% is um, it's, it's grooming. The child has been groomed to think this is a good idea. The child has been groomed to kind of go along with it. And the child has been groomed to, under, to feel good about it. So that's the use of that. Covert seduction is 43%. That is seduction that is using not obvious force. It's not obvious what's going on there. And I've worked with so many people who felt icky about what was going on around them. One young woman, her, her father would take her, put her in her bed and saying goodnight to her. He would stroke her hair all the way down to her butt over and over and over again. She was so uncomfortable with that. Was it sexual abuse? Mm -hmm. It was. It was covert. It wasn't so, uh, the other word for covert. Covert, overt, thank you. Um, and I, I know a young man, his, his, uh, he came to us and he, he was made to put oil on his mother's back. And he would put cream on her back, and, and he felt really icky about it. His mother walked around naked 
all the time. And they were not part of a naturalist group. So he was asked to put cream and oil on his mother's back. He felt really icky about it, really uncomfortable about it. Was it sexual abuse? Yeah. Yeah. And when we talked, he and I, and I said, you know, that sounds like it might have been sexual abuse. He, he just, all the pieces fell together for him. All, everything kind of fell together. He finally got it. Oh, that's why I felt so. And that's why I'm having trouble with relationships. And that's why, and that's why, and that's why, and that's why. You know, that, that just, just made it all clear for him. Of course, I had been seeing him for quite a while before I made that suggestion. You don't make that suggestion to someone you just met. Let's be clear. Um, participated voluntarily, and the voluntarily is in quotes, 22%. They think they were voluntarily participating. Um, lots, of, lots of people went back over and over and over again, and to, they didn't know how not to. They didn't understand that they could say no. And when they finally did say no, stop, it was shocking to them that it stopped. And what happened, they said, I could have made this stop years before. All I had to do was say stop. But they weren't at the age or the maturity to say stop then years before. They didn't know that they could make it stop and go away. They didn't even know that they wanted it to stop and go away sometimes because actually what happens? They're getting special attention. Um, most of the people have come from homes where they weren't getting the attention for a variety of reasons. Maybe there's a seriously ill other child in the family and all the attention's going there. Maybe there is a single parent household and there's no time to give attention. You know, there's a lot, a lot of reasons why children don't get attention. And the, if I looked at, if I could show you the FBI um, book on uh, sexual assault, in there, the pedophiles have said, I can spend way more time with your child than you can. This child craves attention, all children do, for a good reason, that's, you know, that's the way it is. So consequently, they feel like they were voluntary participants. Sad, that, that shame and guilt is hard to break through. Eventually you break through it, but that's hard. Now, why don't men come forward? Shame, guilt, guilt. Judgment. judgment, ego, ego. Socialization. Socialization. socialization, stigma, stigma. stigma. Lack, of education. lack of education, that's what we're doing here tonight, fear, fear. all of the above, that's true. If I tell you I was sexually abused, will you judge me? Will you believe me? Will you see me as less of a man? Will you add to my sense of shame? Will you question my sexuality? Will you think I will abuse? Hmm. That'll keep a man silent for a long, long time. Or will you listen? That, that's the key, huh? Will you listen? And Lynn, I just want to make a, an additional comment about uh, will you see me as less of a man? I was having a very interesting discussion with uh, a couple of our uh, people here about uh, how the rules that are set down for men in this society, and, uh, and I and lots of others like to call that the man box. It's a box that defines how you have to be as a man, strong, self-sufficient, silent, not, uh, not being afraid of anything, not having any feelings, not crying, protector to all, etc., etc. It goes on. Um, big, strong, muscled. Um, not a victim. And this... Um, uh, one of the consequences of this is chronic and systemic victimization of women. Mm -hmm. It's a, a male-dominated patriarchal society. Men are victimized by that as well, mm -hmm. right? And that is one of the huge reasons why they don't come forward. 
when they have been sexually abused because to them and society tells them that equals being weak. That equals not being able to take care of yourself. So mm -hmm. very important to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, <coughs> victim, sexual victim and man seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? Men are not victims. Men are not victims. Men are not supposed to be victims. That keeps a lot of men silent for a long time. We're on to the next one. Okay, do you want me to, okay. Do you want me to do this one? I can do this. Okay. So, uh, we have some stats that Lynn uh, pulled just today. Today. From Stats Canada uh, about the incidence of this in Canada. And I can assure you it's every bit the same south of the border. And often far worse in other parts of the world. Not to minimize what happens here. It happens all over the world. Um, the best estimates we have are that only about six cases out of every 100 of sexual assault. That's men and women, I presume, are reported to police. 60% uh, of the victims are under 17. Why? Because people under 17 are vulnerable, right? Sexual abuse is an abuse of power and status and privilege and authority. And those under 17 are far more vulnerable to that. 17% of girls under 16 have experienced some form of incest and 15% of the victims are boys under 16. That's a lot more than people, most people realize. And uh, how many of you have heard the, the, the statistic one in six? Meaning that according, and I believe this is reflecting American research, but it's very similar here. One out of every six men, believe it or not, has suffered some form of sexual abuse, broadly defined. And one out of every four women. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. remembering that, remembering that men, men don't come forward, as, and women don't come forward, you know, there's a lot of silent suffering out there. We're focusing a lot on men tonight, and because there's, so few resources and we want to raise awareness. It's not a surprise that women be victimized, can be victimized, is it? Think about it. It's not a surprise. It's just a surprise that men are victimized and we have to let people know that it happens to little boys and young men too. And by the way, more and more of the people that come to Male Survivor for help, and I'm sure this is true of other agencies as well, uh, are coming because they've been uh, raped as adults. Um, this, uh, th there's always been a far higher incidence of this than anyone likes to admit. The same difficulties about coming forward with it. And now that public awareness is growing and we're starting to challenge the, the myths around this man box, uh, men are starting to come forward about adult rape as well. You know, I was told years and years ago that um, if a man was, was, his apartment was broken into and he, he came upon the, the people who broke into the apartment, if he arrived there when they were still there, they would rape him so he wouldn't report to the police. That's how they kept him silent from reporting the robbery. Hmm. Interesting. So what in all these numbers, we're talking a lot about numbers, what is the most important number here? One. Each individual man is the most important number here. Each individual person is unique, special. His situation is special and unique and his healing will be different. Each man's healing will be a different journey. That's the important number to remember here, the individual. And what we do when we reach out here, like a day tonight, tonight, we're trying to get 
some guy who's sitting there suffering in silence to come forward and stop suffering in silence and then start having a better life which will start having a better life for his family his friends and everybody around you know it's it's a it's a ripple effect and Lynn there's another way in which that number one is the most important because so many men who come to you and I and male survivor and uh, the gatehouse and I'm sure Justin's organization to uh, have thought for years and decades sometimes half or more of their lives that they were the only one that this happened to mm -hmm. until they can connect with others So the impacts of sexual abuse, poor self-esteem, attempts to numb oneself, so that goes into all kinds of addictions and um, all kinds of things, compulsive behaviors, difficulty with relationships and intimacy, which is so sad. Not only does the perpetrator take away their innocence, they take away their ability to have a beautiful, intimate, loving relationship. So many men can have sex and love, but not in the same bed. Difficulty coping with expressions and of emotions. Difficulty with trust, especially authority. And difficulty with isolation. So I, this, that one, trust, especially with authority. I believe that if we could heal or start working on healing the men who have been sexually abused early on in the game, we could close down half of these damn prisons. Mm -hmm. They're in there because they've got addicted or they're using or they feel they hate authority or they're, they don't know how to have a relationship. On and on it goes, you know. We're putting the money in the wrong place, if you ask me. We're putting it in prisons. We should be putting it in therapy. That's my total belief. And just to underscore that, Lynn's alluding to it, but let's say it out loud, a much, much higher percentage of men in prison have been sexually abused than in the general population. Much yeah. higher. That's Much one higher. of the very unfortunate consequences yeah. of this mm -hmm. kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to do the facts? Yeah. Okay, you do the facts. So, we've talked a bit about some myths that are not true about sexual abuse of men. Uh, let's look at some facts. Men are very often persuaded or experience, they, they, they often experience some degree of pleasure in association with the abuse. Why? Because their bodies respond automatically to certain kinds of touch, uh, Ejaculation may be a consequence of that. Um, and this is something that is exploited by their abusers very often. You enjoyed it. You can't deny that. So implication, you colluded in it. Not true. The body responds this way and the man, the boy, is being victimized, exploited, by an abuser. And the man will often say, my body betrayed me. Mm -hmm. uh, the stimulation happened, I got an erection, my, you know, I, I, I ejaculated, my body betrayed me. And they, they, when they get an erection later on in life, they often lose that erection because they feel like they're getting betrayed again. You know, it's a, just a, a convoluted, mixed up thing. My body betrayed me. No, your body responded to stimulation. That's what happens. You know, stimulation is stim. Mm -hmm. If I threw some pepper in this room in a fan, you would all sneeze. Your body responds to stimulation. It's the end of it, you know, simple. So it's often thought or said that uh, uh, if a man has been sexually abused, he's at higher risk of becoming a sex offender. The statistics, the research does not support this. Um, and it's one of the factors that uh, keeps men silent. Fear 
of being labeled or seen as a, a high-risk individual. So very important thing to, to counteract with the truth. And I had a man who came into my group. He was in my group for well over a year. And he was terrified to tell his adult children that he had been sexually assaulted because he knew they would have to tell their wives. And he felt like they would know he's not going to abuse, but he didn't know if the partners would know. And he was terrified that they would keep the grandchildren away from him. How sad is that? Almost every man who has been sexually abused as a boy, especially if the abuser was male, and most of the abusers are male, um, is very confused about his gender orientation, his sexual orientation. The abuser often contributes to that and exploits that uh, so that men uh, wonder, uh, am I gay? Is this why this happened? The boy that this happens to may or may not be gay, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the fact that he got abused. Right? He was vulnerable. And some abuser exploited that and targeted him for that reason. So recovery is very, very important to help men get clear on the difference between healthy, consensual sexual activity and unhealthy exploitation. Uh, and that's a necessary part of getting more certain and more clear about their own sexual orientation. Anything you want to say on that, Lynn? Yes, just to add to that, men who are born gay, because men are born gay, that's a lot of, a lot of evidence, the research has shown. Men who are, they wonder, they are so confused, because am I gay because I was sexually abused when I was a kid? And that's, that confuses them just as much as it confuses heterosexual men who wonder if they're gay, and, the, and the, uh, the abuser saw that in them, recognized that in them. So they, the confusion goes both ways. You know, am I gay, or is that why I'm gay? Good point, Lynn, thank you. So I mentioned most abusers are male, but not all. And the, the percentage of abusers who are female is surprisingly high. And this also is very difficult for many people and for society to accept because it flies in the face of what we are taught about how men should be and how women should be. Women are supposed to be nurturing mother figures, right? Protectors of uh, their young children. And um, so the common reaction to an abuser who comes forward, uh, uh, sorry, abuse victim who comes forward uh, about having been abused by a female is to be not believed, right? Sorry, that can't have happened. Sometimes, and you, you, you've heard news stories about teachers exploiting students. Uh, female student, female teachers. Yep, female teacher ab abusing a male student. Uh, very often the male is accused of colluding in that or being the instigator. And you know how they put it in the newspaper? She was having a relationship with the boy. Mm -hmm. If it's a male, male teacher and it's a female student, they don't call it a relationship. But if you read it in the paper, they're going to call it a relationship with the boy. That's, that's the truth. And I would tell you, here's anecdotally, in every group of eight men in my, eight, of eight men in my groups, and I've been running those groups for well over 10 years, every, there's two that have been abused by women in eight. That's a quarter all the time, over 10 years of groups. 
So let's talk a little bit about recovery. We are, should we leave this uh, and move on to our panel? Or should we finish this and take our break and then have the panel? Well, we gotta do one or the other, but we gotta move it quickly. Okay. <laughs> let's quickly talk about recovery. So the phases, the phases of healing, first one has to decide to heal, like obviously. Um, and then the next, that's a tough decision to come to actually because, you know, if I come forward, are people going to believe me? Am I going to open up a can of worms? I'm trying to push it down. I've been trying to forget this my whole life. And now I got to talk about it and that's the only way, you know, so you have to decide. I don't want to live like this anymore. You have to establish internal and external safety. What does that mean? You have to be safe enough to not dissociate and crack up and you know, end up in a hospital. You have to have that, you have to have a little stability. You have to be able to ground yourself or learn how to ground yourself. And you have to have external safety. You can't be living in the house where the person who abused you is living. You can't be uh, you, you know, I get a phone call just today where a man had moved, his marriage broke up, moved in with his dad, and then he saw his dad with the four-year-old child and he thought, he got flashbacks. He's, that's what my dad did to me. And he got that kid out of there right away. Nothing had happened yet, but it wasn't a safe place for him, obviously, you know. So you have to be in a safe place. Mind-body awareness. This is the bridge between safety and awareness. You want to talk about this? Yeah. This is your baby. Um, we focus on this a lot in our weekends of recovery and Lynn and I in our private practices. Um, one of the ways survivors of abuse survive is by disconnecting from their emotional feelings, which involves disconnecting from the sensations of what is going on in their bodies. You know, they talk, people talk about being disconnected from the neck down. So an essential piece of recovery is to teach men, help them learn what is going on in their bodies, how to read their own bodies, and how to use feeling words, language that describes emotional feelings, and connect that with the sensations in the body. My, mindfulness is very, very helpful, and we really like this expression, mind-body awareness. Anything you want to say about point four, Lynn? No. Okay. So as we start doing the healing, we start remembering. We start uncovering. One memory leads to another memory. And it's not linear. You know, you, you think, about, think about your eighth birthday. What happened on your eighth birthday? Or some birthday that you can remember. <laughs> it's going to go, I don't know. <laughs> think about a birthday. Do you, do you remember the people arriving at the door, letting them in, sitting them down, getting the gift? Did it? No, you don't remember that. You remember some part of it. This, you know, it's, it comes in pieces. It's not a linear process. We remember bits here, bits there, and that bit might remind us of some other bit, and that's how it happens. So uncovering, starting to talk about it, leads us down that path, not linear. It leaves us down that path. We start uncovering the memories, we start remembering, and we don't have to suffer with it anymore. We have to disconnect from the pain. And if we keep it stuffed inside, we're gonna, it's gonna spread out somewhere, spill out somewhere else, and we're going to act out in ways that you know, don't serve us well. We start believing it, and then we start feeling it. We start getting in touch with that. We start feeling the pain the discomfort, and then we start feeling the joy. Because when we're not feeling the, ha the, the painful parts, we're not feeling the joy anyway. We just tuck it, touch it, stop it all. Stop all the good stuff and stop all the bad stuff. You just don't cut off half the feelings. And then we get in, we, the next step, maybe near the end, empowerment. We become from a victim to a survivor and then to a thriver. 
People ask me all the time, how will I know when I'm, when I'm done? And I say, when you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, I'm really glad you became you. That's when you know you're done. So celebrating it. Uh, learning to be dysfunction. I'm going to roll right on. Because yep. Okay. Please do. Learning to be disfun disloyal to dysfunction. Um, we, we have used coping strategies all our life. And all of a sudden, we're going to stop using them. Um, and what, what are we doing instead? Well, sometimes we'll slip back into using them again. And we hate that. You know, we are not happy with that. We're, we're unhappy with ourselves. We feel like we're a failure. That's not true. We're trying to learn to be disloyal to the dysfunction and loyal to functionality. Isn't this a beautiful bowl? I have, I have no idea how to say that. Somebody, somebody say that name for me. Anybody? Kitsukori, thank you very much. This is a Japanese bowl. And they take the broken pottery and they mend it with, with gold. And it, it's such a beautiful thing. They take the broken pieces and when they heal it, they put it together, it's with gold. It, it, it just makes the bowl so much nicer. And if I can just make one comment to wrap that up, uh, it's beautiful. It's beautiful in its brokenness. Yeah. The way it has mended highlights its brokenness and celebrates it. And that's true for survivors in recovery as well. Mm -hmm. And any of you who may be men in recovery from sexual abuse, you will get to a point, believe it or not, where you will feel some level of gratitude that it happened because you have become uh, a more powerful and more alive man than you might have otherwise through the healing process. Yeah. Okay, it's break time. It's a few minutes past break. We are kind of out of uh, um, our, we had a different flow here, but we're, we're, we're out of it now. So we're going to take the break now. When we come back, we're going to have the panel, and then we'll be able to have some Q&A, and then we'll wrap it up.